Yes, I can read. Thank you, Prabhuji. Chatur Varnyam Maya Shristam Guna Karma Vibhagasha Tasya Kar Taram Apimam Vidi Akar Taram Avyayam. Translation According to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of societies are created by me. And although I am the creator of this system, you should know that I am yet the non doer being unchangeable. Pure poet by Srila Prabhupada. The Lord is a creator of everything. Everything is born of him. Everything is sustained by him and everything after annihilation rests in him. He is therefore the creator of the four divisions of the social order, beginning with the intelligent class of men, technically called Brahmanas, due to their being situated in the mode of goodness. Next is the administrative class, technically called the Kshatriyas, due to their being situated in the mode of passion. The mercantile men, called the Vaish Vaishyas, are situated in the mixed modes of passion and ignorance. And Shudras, or laborer class, are situated in the ignorant mode of material nature. In spite of his creating the four divisions of human society, Lord Krishna does not belong to any of these divisions. Because he is not one of the conditioned souls, a section of whom form human society. Human society is similar to, an, to any other animal society, but the nature, but to elevate and from the animal status, the above mentioned divisions are created by the Lord for the systematic development of Krishna consciousness. The tendency of a particular man toward work is determined by the modes of material nature which he has acquired. Such symptoms of life, according to the different modes of material nature, are described in the 18th chapter of this book. A person in Krishna consciousness, however, is above even the Brahmanas. And through Brahmanas, by quality, are supposed to know about Brahman, the supreme absolute truth. Most of them approach only the impersonal Brahman manifestation of Lord Krishna. But a man who transcends the limited knowledge of a But a man who transcends... Yeah, now yeah. I'm back. <clears throat> but all through Brahmanas, by quality, are supposed to know about Brahman, the supreme absolute truth, most of them approach only the impersonal Brahman manifestation of Lord Krishna. But a man who transcends the limited knowledge of a Brahmana and reaches the knowledge of the supreme personality of God, Lord Sri Krishna, becomes a person in Krishna consciousness, or, in other words, a Vaishnava. Krishna consciousness includes knowledge of all different planetary expansion, plenary, sorry, expansions of Krishna, namely Rama, Nishringa, Vara, etc. And as Krishna is transcendental to the system of the four divisions of human society, a person in Krishna consciousness is also transcendental to all divisions of human society, whether we consider the divisions of community, nation, or species. Hare Krishna. Okay, so this is a very interesting verse. Lord Krishna said he is the creator of this division of society. And he has divided the society into four divisions. Now Srila Prabhupada explains that these four divisions are present everywhere. Wherever you go, it's not just in India or just in Vedic times that these four divisions are there. But when we look at people today, you'll see everywhere there's an intellectual class like the Brahmana. There's the administrative or managerial class like the Kshatriya. There's the business class, like the Vaishya. 
and there are the laborers or the workers, like the sudras. So these four divisions are everywhere. Of course, materialistic people don't like this division of society. And they try to create, they make propaganda for a classless society. A society without class, without distinction. They say it's not good to discriminate against people. They say this, these divisions of society lead to prejudice and unfair advantages are given to the intellectual class. Just like the brahmanas. Because once someone is a brahmana, they're thinking, I'm the head, I'm the leader of the society, and you should respect me. But the head is important, but the legs are also important. The sudra is like the legs. The kshatriya is like the arms, the vaisha is like the belly. They're all parts of the body. So in the body, all parts of the body are important. It's not that only the brahmanas are important. The sudras, the vaishyas, the kshatriyas, they're also important. So we should give proper respect to everyone and there should be cooperation among the four parts. They need each other's cooperation. There, needs to, there has to be this cooperation between the brahmana and the kshatriya and the vaishya and the sudra. The brahmana is meant to give direction for the material and spiritual benefit of the other classes. The kshatriya is meant to protect and look after the welfare and organize the society, protect the people against, against the dacoits and the infidels. And the Vaishya, their duty is meant, they're meant to make sure that there's proper agriculture going on and produce crops and grains and then also animal protection, protecting the cows is especially important. So the Vaishya's duty, Krishi Gorakshavaninam Vaishya Karma Swabhavajam. Vaishya's duty is like that, farming and cow protection. Lord Krishna came, of course, when he came 5,000 years ago, he came as a, Bra as a, as a Vaishya. He came in the family of Nanda Maharaj and took care of the cows. Every day he's going out in the forest of Vrindavan with the cows. And Krishna enjoys being with the cows. It's a very wonderful experience. The cows are very special creatures. So we'd like everyone to get the opportunity to experience the gentle nature and how how uh, wonderful these cows are, that they simply eat grass and they give the most important food in the form of milk. And that milk can be used to make ghee and to make butter and cheese and yogurt and so many things. Many delicious types of foodstuffs come from milk. And the milk comes from mother cow. So the cows are very important in the society. They have to be protected. All they want is some grass. And we should make arrangements to take care of the cows that they can get proper grass, proper food. And in return, they will give their milk. So that's the Vaishya's job. And the Sudra's job, they, their job is to work, to work in the service of others. They're told what to do. Some parts, when you have sudras, they're, they're simply given food and clothing and a place to stay. Because if you give them money, they'll just simply waste it and they'll take to drinking and gambling and so many bad habits. So better not to give a sudra money, better just let them have food to eat and nice clothes to wear and a place to stay. Then their basic needs are taken care of. They don't need anything else. So this, this, this is how society is meant to be organized. 
people should work together, help each other. The Vaishyas producing the food, the Kshatriyas managing and protecting people, and the Brahmanas guiding them and educating them. So this is Lord Krishna's arrangement, right? Chatur Vanam Maya Shristam. Krishna said, I am the creator of these four divisions of society. So we have to recognize Lord Krishna's plan and work in court. But we shouldn't think because I'm a Brahmin, I'm, I'm better than somebody who's a Sudra. No. Somebody may be a Brahmana, but if he's not a devotee of Krishna, then he, he's, he, he's useless. If he doesn't understand Krishna and the position of Krishna, then even though he may be a Brahmana, well-educated and qualified Brahmana, but if he doesn't recognize Lord Krishna, then his Brahminical qualifications are all useless. But one may be a Sudra, but if he has full devotion for Lord Krishna, then his life is successful and he's the greatest person because he's got devotion for Lord Krishna. So the birth is not important. What is important is the character and the qualifications, the behavior, the qualities. Birth alone is not the qualification. So these four divisions are created according to Chaturvanam Maya Shristam, Guna Karma Vibhagashak. It's not Janma, it's Guna and Karma, quality and activity, meaning work, how, how, how we work. If you work in the corp multinational corporation, that's Sudra work. Sudras work in a company. Sudras work for others. But Brahmanas, won't work for others. And Kshatriyas also, they won't work for others. But they'll cooperate together to help each other. So somebody can change their position. They may, the father may be a Brahmin. Doesn't mean all this, doesn't mean the son is also a Brahmin. We have to see the qualification. We have to see the nature. What's the person's nature? And people, somebody may have even, they may have the, the, the qualities of the Brahman, but they don't work like a Brahman. Although they had the opportunity to be a Brahman, they don't want to work like a Brahman. They don't want to do the Brahminical duties. Rather, they want to be sudras. They want to do all kinds of bad habits, drinking, gambling, womanizing, these kind of things. And so this is the business of less educated people. So the Vedic system, the organization of society was to protect people from that, this kind of thing. Where there's good leaders, good Brahmins, good Kshatriyas, then people are protected. They need to see the good example. Okay, are there any questions? Guru Maharaj, does everybody have an equal chance to go back to Godhead? Can a Sudra also can go back to Godhead or he has to come to the step of Brahmana or? Yes. This is described in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna said, even one may be of lower birth, but still he can attain the supreme destination if he takes shelter of me. So one may be of lower birth, and Krishna mentions who are of lower birth. He said, Striya, women, Sudra, Vaishya, they can all attain the supreme destination if they take shelter of me. So it's not the birth. Everyone can go back to Godhead. But you have to follow the process. You have to come to the, up to the standard. You cannot just eat anything and everything and think, oh, I love Krishna. And at the same time, we're eating all nonsense, non-vegetarian. 
No, and we have to chant the names of Krishna. We have to hear about Krishna and worship Krishna. Then you go back to Godhead. Everyone has the opportunity, but who wants to go? People are saying, oh, I'm okay here. I'm watching my television. I have my movies. I'm watching so many nice movies on television. I have so many, I have so many nice things to do here. I don't need to go back to Godhead. People are thinking like that. They do not see that this world, this life is very temporary, that our time here will soon be finished and we'll have to give up the body. We have to move. Although we don't want to give up the body, we are forced to. The body is taken from us and we have to leave. We have to give up one body, we take another body according to our qualification. So we are, we are sowing the seed for the next life. This body is like shetra, it's like the field. And just like you plant seeds in the field, according to what you, the seeds you plant, you will harvest. If you plant the seeds of melons, you will harvest melons. You won't harvest beans. If you want to harvest beans, you have to plant the seeds of beans. So this is the principle. We're preparing for the next life according to the, the seeds and the activities which we're doing in this life will determine our body in the next life. Right? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Even the Christian Bible recognizes, in the Bible it says, as you sow, so shall you reap. As you sow, this, you sow the seeds, you reap accordingly, according to the seeds you've sown. Or in Hindi, they say, jaisa karega, aisa barega. You do like that, you get like that. As you do, you will get. The results come to you. Now this, this is the law of nature. It's everywhere, in every culture. Even China, they have a saying like that. So we have to learn how to live in this world, how to make proper use of the human body. We're very fortunate to have the human body on this planet. This is the earthly planet in the region of the universe, which is called Bharata Kanda. And it's a very special place. It's a very great opportunity to take a human form of life in this place said even the, de even the devas in the heavenly planets want to come and take a human birth here. And they regret that they wasted their life because they, the devas, they, when they were here on this earth planet, they were doing Vedic rituals and they were giving charity and they were doing some tapasya and the result of these things, they got a heavenly body. They took birth in the heavenly planets, but they regret that. They say the birth in this heavenly planet is useless. They said better a moment on the earth planet than a whole life of so many thousands of years in the heavenly planets. Because with that moment of consciousness on the earth planet, you can get perfection. You can go back to Godhead. But up in the heavenly planets, very difficult to go back to Godhead. What they will do, they'll come back here. After they've used up their piety in heaven, they'll come back to this planet. And then they have to earn their piety again. You understand? Yes, Guru Maharaj. So is it like we have to identify ourselves with one of these categories and work accordingly or how should we do Guru Maharaj? Like this. Uh... 
Well, we should be directed by a spiritual teacher. You know, generally when we go to school, that, you know, we'll be recognized according to our particular nature. The teacher will recognize that this person likes to study or this person doesn't like to study. And this person likes to control people. He's a leader, you know, he's giving orders, giving instructions, he's, he's got people around him like that. And somebody else's nature is to be more of an inclined to business. And they're quite, they don't mind about lying and cheating and doing these kind of things like people often do when they do business. So people's different natures will be recognized. And according to their nature, they should find work which will satisfy them. Yeah? Yes, Guru Maharaj, but uh, yeah, nowadays it's not possible, right, uh, Guru Maharaj? I see in the uh, software industry, many people, they leave their agriculture and come and work so confused and uh, nobody is there to guide them. Yes, well, people are there, but they don't go to look for them. They're not ready to take guidance from someone. They have to be ready to hear. It's, it's only certain people who are willing to take guidance and take instruction. Other people, they're just attached to eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. They're animal activities. Eating, sleeping, mate, and defend. And they're happy. They're thinking that's the goal of life. And they want to improve their eating, improve their sleeping, like that. They're thinking that that is life. They don't understand there's something more to life than just these activities. They're not understanding the real purpose of life, which begins, you have to hear from the devotees. You have to be willing to hear. You have to understand there's a higher purpose to life. We're not meant to just live like the animals. We're meant to inquire about life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? So we have to think about these kind of things. And if we, if we inquire properly, then you'll get the answers to your inquiries. And then you should want to take up the necessary activities. Just like we tell people, human life is meant for thoughtfulness, to ask, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going when I give up this body? What will happen to me? So to understand these things, we have to be willing to do a little bit, a little bit, make a little sacrifice, you know, control our mind and senses. And we have to sit and chant the holy name. That's important. If you do the chanting properly, then you awaken more understanding, more knowledge. From the heart, Krishna will tell you what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to eat, what you're not supposed to eat, these kind of things. Doesn't matter if you're a Kshatriya or a Vaishya or a Sudra or a Brahman, they're all meant to follow these kind of principles. Cleanliness. Is it important? Cleanliness, of course, it's very important. Mercy. Isn't mercy a good quality? Certainly it is. Austerity. That's very important, very good for us to purify us, to make us humble and truthfulness. Yes, we should be truthful. We should be trained to be truthful. So these are the four principles of religion. Dharma is based on these four qualities. Cleanliness, mercy, austerity, and truthfulness. 
the problem is people today they don't want they don't want to do these things they don't even care they're not very clean they don't care to wash the cloth regularly hardly they take bath I know, of course, some countries like Switzerland, where it's quite cold in the winter, it's a bit difficult to take bath regularly, probably. And then to dry cloth, you wash your cloth, it may take days to dry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not very easy. <laughs> Sometimes in countries like Switzerland to follow these kind of principles. Anyway, cleanliness and mercy. Mercy means mercy to other living entities. We don't like to kill. We don't like to see animals suffering and going through the trauma of being slaughtered. It's not a very pleasant thing to see people cut the, cut the animals up. Would people, any, any normal person, if they see the animals, how they're treated, they'd be horrified. But so many people, they still, they eat, they eat meat, they eat everything. So mercy is destroyed by meat eating. And then intoxication. Intoxication destroys austerity. Intoxication means taking things like alcohol, drugs and smoking cigarettes and all these things, even coffee and tea are drugs. They stimulate us. Another intoxication, another form of intoxication is pride. That people are very proud. They don't want to surrender. They don't want to hear they don't want to chant. They're thinking, I know everything. You don't have to tell me this. I know everything. They don't know anything. But they're so proud. They don't want to hear. So that is intoxication. And that destroys austerity. Austerity is important. And to cultivate austerity, we have to be humble. And finally, truthfulness. Truthfulness is very important. It said the earth can bear any burden except that of a person who is not truthful. If someone's a liar, it's not good. So we're trained usually to be truthful, to be clean, to be austere, and to be uh, merciful. These are the pillars of religion. And therefore, everyone, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, men and women, young men and old men, women and children, everyone should follow these principles. Yes? Is it clear? Yes, Guru Maharaj, very clear now. Yeah, peep, as you said, uh, here we can see they don't take baths regularly. My, yeah, yes, Guru Maharaj, weekly once or something like that. My yeah. daughter also asked me weekly. that, why, sorry, Guru Maharaj. Weekly once. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. I know this, because I'm from the West also, so I know also like that weekly once. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, your daughter. daughter also, yeah, after going to school, she said, "Can I take bath in the evening, or don't have to take bath in the morning?" Then we have to insist her to take bath in mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good to take bath in the morning. Yeah, because when we sleep, then different things come out from the body in the course of our sleep. And we need to wash them off by bathing. The mode of ignorance is very strong when we sleep in the night. So when we take bath in the morning, then we wash off the mode of ignorance. 
So it's it's good to get that habit, to have that habit to be. <laughs> you know, Srila Prabhupada, he used to travel quite a bit and he would go through the airport sometimes. And one time he came through the airport, he was in Bangkok and he decided he wanted to take a bath. And so he went into the gents' toilet and he had his lota and he put on his gumsha and he started pouring water over himself while he was in the, in the men's room there. <laughs> and there was a, you know, one man was there taking care of the men's room and keeping it clean. He just looked at Prabhupada and he didn't know what to say. And Prabhupada just stood in and Prabhupada took his bath, poured water over himself, and soaked up and then bathed, washed, washed all the soap off and dressed himself, put on his tea light. And the man, the man just looked at him. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, well, I needed, I needed to refresh myself. He said, I wanted to take bath. <laughs> Prabhupada didn't care where he was, he had to take his bath. Okay. Will we go ahead? Yes, sir. Uh, 4.14. Uh, Ramya Mataji, do you want to read? Hare Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna. Namam Karmani Nimpati Nami Karma Palas Praga Iti Mam Yo Vijayanti Karma Madir Na Sabatyate. Translation There is no work that affects me, nor do I inspire for the fruits of action. One who understands this truth about me also does not belong entangled in the fruitive reactions of work. Puppet, as there are constitutional laws in the material world stating that the king can do no wrong or that the king is not subject to the state laws. Similarly, the Lord, although he is the creator of this material world, is not affected by the activities of the material world. He creates and remains alone from the creation, whereas the living entities are entangled in the fruitive results of material activities because of their propensity for loading, loading it over material resources. The Hare Krishna, Ramya Mataji, Hare Krishna. The proprietor of an establishment is not responsible for the right and wrong activities of the workers, but the workers are themselves responsible. The living entities are engaged in their respective activities of sense gratification, and these activities are not ordained by the Lord. For advancement of sense gratification, the living entities are in, engaged in the work of the world and they aspire to heavenly happiness after death. The Lord being full in himself has no attraction for so-called heavenly happiness. The heavenly demigod or only is engaged servant. The proprietor never desires the low-grade happiness such as the workers may desire. He is aloof from material actions and reactions. For example, the rains are not responsible for different types of vegetations that appear on the earth, although without such rain, there is no possibility of vegetative growth. Vedic Smriti confirms this fact as follows. Nimitta matram eva shau shradhyanam sarga karmani 
பிரதான காரணி பூத யதோ வை சிஜா சக்தயா in the material creation the lord is only the supreme cause the immediate cause is material nature but by which the cosmic manifestation manifestation is made visible the created beings are of many varieties such as demigods human beings and lower animals and all of them are subject to the reactions of their past good and ba- or bad activities the lord only gives them the proper facilities for such activities and the regulations of the modes of nature but he is never responsible for their past and present activities in the vedanta sutra 2.3.2.1.34 2.1.34 it is confirmed vaishamya nairgranye na sapeksha sattva the lord is never partial to any living entity the living entity is responsible for its own act the lord only gives him facilities through the agencies of material nature the external energy anyone who is fully conversant with all the intricacies of this law of karma or fruitive activities does not become affected by the results of this activity in other words the person who understands the transcendental nature of the lord is an experienced man in krishna consciousness and thus he is never subjected to the laws of karma one who does not know the transcendental nature of the lord and who thinks that the activities of the lord are aimed at fruitive results as are the activities of the ordinary living entities certainly becomes entangled himself in fruitive reaction but one who knows the supreme truth is a liberated soul fixed in krishna consciousness hari krishna i'm really sorry i got disconnected in the middle sorry no Vaishnava. problem no problem Madhuri. i'll do no, the next I, one yes so this is a very uh, interesting verse with a very interesting purport and prabhupad gives many examples in the purport also about the relationship between the lord and the material nature and the living entities right the lord is called the ishwara the living entity is the jiva and the material nature is prakriti so ishwara jiva and prakriti the relationship between these things of course the lord is the supreme over everything so the, he, he is in charge it's, it's his prakriti and the jiva the living entity is also type of prakriti is also we are the living entities are superior prakriti we are also the energy of lord krishna and we are meant for his pleasure but we work in the other way we work with a different consciousness so we have to understand the supreme position of lord krishna as he said in this verse lord krishna is not trying to enjoy the fruits of action so we have to understand krishna's transcendental position Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like w- when it rains, many different things are produced from the rain. It's not all one. You get different kinds of vegetation being produced by the rain, right? Uh, we see different types of vegetation appearing, although each were coming from the earth and they each got the rain but still so many different vegetables grow it's not only one thing grows you get so many different varieties so the same is true in the, this material world we see there are different kinds of people with different natures and different positions and there's the proprietor proprietor of the company and then there's the workers now the proprietor of the company he's not going to enjoy life on the level of the workers 
the workers, they have their level of enjoyment and the proprietor, he has his own level of enjoyment. The proprietor, he's going to, you know, have different lifestyle than the ordinary workers. The workers may be satisfied with a different level of happiness because that's their position. They don't enjoy like the people who are just ordinary workers or laborers. So the same way the Supreme Lord is there and he doesn't enjoy the way we enjoy. We have to under, we shouldn't apply our level of thinking and enjoyment to the Supreme Lord. The Lord is on a very different level. He is the Supreme and we are all subordinate to him. So then Prabhupada explains how just like there are demigods. There, there's many different varieties of beings, living entities in the world. And we have the demigods. And then you have human beings. And then you have animals, different levels. People who have a lot of piety, they're in the level of demigods. And the human beings, they're earning their pious and sinful activities. They're going to get the results of their activities. And the animals, those living entities who are in the animal body, they're, being, they're suffering because of their past sins. That animal body is a reaction to their past sins. So this is the law of nature. And who's responsible for it? We are each responsible for our own activities. We cannot say, oh, Krishna is cruel to me. He gave me this kind of body. He put me in this dog body. Or he put me in this tree body. It's our own doing. Because of our activities, because of the way we behave, the things we, we did, therefore we got this kind of body. We have to be very careful, very conscious how we live, what we do in, the, in our body. And particularly when we're in the, the human body, it's only the human beings who are getting this karma. When an animal eats meat, the animal doesn't get any karma. It's not sinful for the animal. The dog may eat meat. It's not going to get karma for that because it's, he's in the dog body. But the human being, he gets karma. He gets karma for his activities. We see the dog sometimes making in the street. But if a human being tries to do that, they'd be arrested. They'd be locked up. You cannot behave like that. Of course, we're supposed to be civilized. So human, human life, we're meant to be civilized. But what is the level of civilization? There are different standards of civilization. So that is there. Just like some, in some parts of the world, some of the, the, the people there, they may eat other people. When someone gets old, they will kill them and cook them, and they will eat their flesh. The grandparents, for example, they become the food for the grandchildren. The, the grandparents will, will be killed and then they'll cook them and they'll eat the human flesh. So some parts, some, there are some civilizations like that. They're tribal or they're uncivilized. And there are different levels of civilization. Some people are more cultured, more controlled. We have to understand what is the proper level for human beings. So, living entity, if, if we don't follow the laws, then we get the reactions. It's not Krishna's fault. He's neutral. The example is given, just like in the court. A person may come to the court before the judge, and the judge may reward him and say, yes, you, you were injured in the car accident. It was not your fault. 
the person who was driving the car, the other car, hit you and you were injured, so they should pay you compensation. And the judge may award compensation, a big sum of money to the person who was injured. And then the next person comes in the court and the judge may find out that this person uh, stole money and he used the money to do sinful things. And so the judge may sentence him to go to jail. So the person may say, hey, you know, why like this? The last person came and you gave him money. You gave him a lot of money, compensate. Why are you sending me to jail? The judge says, well, I have to act. I have to give you the proper result of your deeds. Whatever you do, you get the result. It's not that I'm favoring one person more than another. In the same way, Krishna doesn't favor one person over another. Krishna is equal to everyone. But if somebody does some service for Krishna, then that is pleasing to Krishna. So we want to try to please Krishna. That's the point. But we have to know how to please him. So Krishna is pleased when we can chant his name and when we can control our mind and senses, act in the proper way. And we should give proper respect for other forms of life. We shouldn't want to kill and got, cause any pain to others. So the happiness we get is our, due to our own doing. Not, it's not that Krishna is just kind to him and not kind to us. It's our own doing. We are responsible for our own results. Right? Any question? Uh, Guru Maharaj, I have one doubt. Here it is said that Krishna is not an integral to any fruitive reactions. Uh, but after Mahabharata, um, like why Lord Krishna was readily able to accept Gandhari's um, curse, uh, Guru Maharaj, but he is not... Um, He's not entangled. He's not entangled to any uh, fruitive actions for whatever else he has done. But he accepted that curse, uh, Guru Maharaj. How should I connect or understand this? What curse? Uh, about that uh, Yadava Kula vanishing um, when Gandhari was cursing the, after the Mahabharata war. After the Mahabharata war, Gandhari put curses on Lord Krishna. Krishna, yeah, for the Yadava Kula should not. Uh, Yadava Kula uh, will go, uh, will vanish after the, um, because of, um, because he, um, uh, Gandhari's son was destroyed, uh, Gandhari's son was, were killed during the war, right? So yeah. because of that, Gandhari uh, became angry and she was cursing Krishna. That is, Kula will, uh, will not survive. Like that. Uh huh. Well, she can curse Krishna, but it's up to Krishna if he wants the curse to take effect or not. Now, sometimes Krishna may be cursed, and sometimes he may allow the curse to take effect, and some sometimes he won't allow it to take effect. Just like Garuda, the carrier of Lord Vishnu, Garuda. He was also cursed by Subari Muni because Garuda likes to eat fish. Garuda is a bird and birds like to eat fish. So Subari Muni, he was meditating in the bottom of the Yamuna and Garuda came there and he took a big fish from the Yamuna to eat. So Subari Muni felt very upset and he cursed Garuda that if he ever comes here again, he will certainly die. So Garuda respected that curse. Now, actually, Subari Muni had no right to curse Garuda because Garuda is a very great devotee. He's the personal servant of Lord Vishnu. But Subari Muni cursed him in that way. So Subari Muni, uh, uh, rather Garuda, out of respect for the curse, he didn't go to the Yamuna again. He said, I'll just leave. Okay, I'm not going to go there again. I, I can go other places. There's so many fish other places. I don't need to just go there. 
so out of respect for the curse he fall. And then similarly, Lord Krishna, he, he may observe the curse, he may not. It's up to him. He may accept it. And sometimes the curse is actually the plan of the Lord. And so Krishna has planned. He, you know, it's, it can be also the Leela of Lord Krishna that he should be cursed. And in this way, he will leave the world. He will finish his pastimes. Actually, there's another pastime which took place, which caused the destruction of the Yadu dynasty. And is described in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that Samba, one of the sons of Lord Krishna, he got an iron ball, a big, a large iron ball, and he put it in his shirt. And then he dressed himself up in a sari and made himself look like a woman. And then the other boys brought him before the great sages. And they said to the great sages that, oh, great sages, is this woman going to give birth to a boy or a girl? You know, they pretended that Samba was a pregnant woman because he put this big iron ball inside his shirt, inside his waist. And so they asked the sages, is this a young lady going to give birth to a boy or a girl? So the sages, they knew what was happening and they said, this, this child will be the cause of the destruction of the whole Yadu dynasty. That was the curse. Well, that's what the sages said. They said, this child will be the cause of the destruction of the whole Yadu dynasty. So it happened that that iron ball, which was in the, in the shirt of Samba, was taken and they ground it to powder. And these pieces of dust, they were taken in the fibers of the grass, which was growing along the side of the seashore. And it was these fibers which were used in the, in the killing of all the Yadu dynasty. The Yadu dynasty fought with each other and they killed each other. And in this way, they finished their lila with Lord Krishna and Dwarka. And then there was one piece of metal from the ball, which they couldn't grind to dust. And that piece of metal that was taken, it was found by the hunter Jara. And the hunter Jara used that piece of metal and he made an arrowhead. And that arrowhead was the arrow which was fired into the lotus foot of Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna took that opportunity to finish his pastimes in this world. And so these curses and so on, actually Lord Krishna is not obliged to accept these curses and certainly he can overcome them. But he, often he will make use of them for some purpose. Like he has to leave the world, he cannot stay here forever. So he makes use of that curse to finish his pastimes here. You understand? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. I understand. Okay. So we'll be chanting Hare Krishna now, Vaishnavi? Yes, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> 